I can see you. Pull your skirt down, young lady. Pull your pants up. I gave him a bath last night. You do not talk to your mother that way. Do not run in this house. I'm gonna get you. Yeah, honey, I, I see you. Yeah, I see you. I don't know why. Do not ask me why. Because I said so. What do you say? Yes, what? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please. Can you say thank you? Do you want to go to timeout? Timeout right now. Go to your room. What did I just say to you? What did I just say? You wait till dad gets home. Do not make me tell you again. How do you know you don't like it? You've never even tried it. Did you brush? I'm gonna feel your toothbrush. Don't forget to flush. I don't hear a flush. Who didn't flush? Do not touch anything. Hey babe, is there any more C-A-N-D-Y? What about R-E-D-V-E-L-V-E-T-C-A-K-E? -E -E? Where's your shoe? Why do you only have one shoe? We're leaving, get your shoes. Where are your pants? I can't understand you, can you use your words? I don't know. Go ask your dad. Go ask your mom. You buckled? Why are you not buckled? Do not make me stop this car. I will turn this car around. We will get there when we get there. Quiet! Shh! Oh, for those of you who are just joining us, last Sunday we began a series of messages, sound bites, little morsels of truth for parenting and grandparenting that, that uh, hopefully will give it encouragement as we try to train our children in the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so from Mother's Day to Father's Day, we're going to use the acrostic trains, and we're going to give six principles for, for training your children in the Lord so that they would follow his will, discover who he is, and honor him, honor them with, with their life. Last week we began with the letter T, and we, we talked about time, and how critical time is. That time is a commodity that is more valuable than anything. And that if we're going to train up our children the way they should go, train up our grandchildren the way they should go, it's going to require not just quantity, but quality time. It requires an investment. And, and the commission that God has given us isn't to help our kids to just get a degree and to go into college and get a career. In fact, if you take the words of Jesus and you take the, the, what, what, and the, the, the Shema in the Old Testament that says, teach your kids to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to keep it before them. The, the goal isn't to help our kids to be successful in this life without Christ. It's to help our kids to know Christ and allow God to direct their steps so that they can be successful according to the heart of God. In fact, Jesus said this way, what is it proper to man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? What good is it if we help our kids to have a great life by earthly standards but they miss heaven, they miss the relationship with God? And so we talked about time and how critical it was. Today, we're gonna to turn the, our attention to the, the letter R and responsibility. We have a, a, a responsibility as parents, as grandparents, to train our children so that they live responsibly in this world. And as I started thinking about how do we teach responsibility, what is responsibility, I thought about that great theologian, Andy Griffin. And, and, and so I have a little video that I want to sh show you to kind of get our, our, our minds thinking about what it means to live responsibly. Watch this. <coughs> now, what's this about rules for pa's and sons? This first, the 75 cent rule. The 75 cent rule, I don't, uh, I don't believe I ever heard of that one. Well, and that's what I figured. What it is, Pa, is that nowadays, kids get 75 cents a week allowance instead of 25 cents. 75 cents? That's a lot of money. And in a year's time, I'd come to see there's 52 weeks in a year it comes to around forty dollars a year. <laughs> That's an awful lot of money for a young. They get it, Pa. They do, huh? And they don't have to work for it like I do. Hmm. Well, who is this? Uh, this day you keep talking about? Oh, Arnold Winkler and everybody. Arnold Winkler. I don't believe I know him, do I? They're new from Raleigh. Oh, I see. And, and the Raleigh rules say uh, say seven five cents and no work, huh? I guess. Mm -hmm. You want it straight, don't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, here it goes. There are no rules for pa's and sons. Uh, it's as simple as this. Each, uh, each mother or father raises his boy or girl 
as the case may be, the way that uh, he thinks is best. And I think it's best for you to get a quarter and work for it. You see, when you give something, in this instance, clean the garage, and you get something in return, like a quarter, well, that's the greatest feeling in the world. You do feel good after working, don't you? Uh-huh. Good and tired. <laughs> well, as, uh, as you get bigger, well, you'll be doing more and more work for more and more return, and that good feeling will get bigger. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. Good. I'm not going to get the 75 cents. <laughs> and I have to work for the 25. Right. It's all clear to you? Yeah. The bigger you get, the tireder you get. <laughs> well, uh, you, just, you just think about that for a while. Do I have to? Don't you want to think about it? It makes me kind of sad. <laughs> well, the thing to do when you're feeling sad is to shoot for the good feeling. Clean the garage. Right. It's long, Paul. The long time. Responsibility. Now, you guys want it straight, right? We're living in a day of gross irresponsibility. In fact, I would say, and I never dreamed that I, this would necessarily happen in my lifetime, but I would say that irresponsibility has almost become a civil right. It's terrifying. It's terrifying that my plight in life is because someone else is to blame. That if something doesn't work out the way that I think it ought to work out, that I'm entitled to it. And someone else has to shoulder the responsibility for it. It's pretty scary what's happening in our nation. It's pretty scary the things that are being handed down like edicts. And all of it's fostered in the sense of, I do not have to be responsible for myself. I, I won't get political other than just to lay that out there. I will say this, and I think this is really important to hear. Here's how it works. I have the right to my irresponsibility, but you do not have the right to hold me responsible. And it gets worse. Because what you do have is the responsibility to flip the bill and to clean up the mess that I have made with my irresponsible behavior. That is pervasive in our culture right now. And so one of the things that I believe that is critical if we're going to train our children in the Lord, and one of the things that these graduates are going to be facing now that within just a few months they're going to be going out on their own, is the idea of responsibility. See, if a parent chooses not to take their responsibility to raise their children to live responsibly, then they have taught their children how to live irresponsibly as they have lived irresponsibly. And so there's something, there's skin in the game for all of us. Now here's, that, that, that's the tough news. Here's the good news. It's never too late to start living responsibly. Whether you're 17 years old or whether you're 77 years old. You may have lived irresponsibly. You may have taught others to be irresponsible. But the only person that can change that and change the future is you when you begin to live responsibly. And that is a commission. That is a call that we find in Scripture. I want you to listen to this statement. Irresponsibility doesn't just impact you. It impacts everyone around you. It impacts your family, your church, your community, your country. Why? Because all irresponsibility has to be shouldered by someone else. All irresponsibility has to be shouldered by someone else. Someone always has to pay the bill. Someone always has to clean up the mess. I was thinking about this the uh, uh, last couple of weeks as I've been trying to teach my youngest son, Camden, how to, when he gets up in the morning, he goes down and sits, and my, my wife generally makes him breakfast. He sits there, he turns on the television, he eats his breakfast, and I can't tell you how many times I've walked downstairs, and he's already gone off to school, and a bowl is sitting there on the counter with some milk in it, and the TV is still on. And I've gone to him and said, 
Would you please put your dish in the dishwasher and would you please turn off the television? I even took in the remote and showed him that he has to push this button and this button and amazing, both of those things turn off. Well, one day I, 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 was, I, was, I went down and after three or four times of telling him, I was a little frustrated and, and I looked at him and, and I said, son, would you please put your bowl up? And he kind of gave me this <coughs> and starts kind of stomping around and clanging it. And he was letting me know his displeasure with me asking him to clean up the mess behind him. So I said, here's what we're going to do. From this point on, every time I come down, if your dish is there and, and, and your TV on, it's a dollar for each one. Well, it's amazing how that started working out better for him. Well, then about, about two weeks ago, I, I walked down and, and he had left it. And, 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 and so I called him down and I said, Camden. And, and I pointed over to the bowl and he gave me that look. And I said, no, no, you don't need to go clean it up. I want you to ask me to go clean up your mess. See, it's your responsibility, but you're being irresponsible. So now you're making it my responsibility. And so he looks at me and goes, I, I, I'll get it. And I said, no, 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 no. I want you to ask me to go and clean up your mess. And he just was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And I said, no, 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 ask me. Dad, I'll do it. No, 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 ask me. And he goes, Dad, will you clean up my mess? I said, no, go clean up your mess. <laughs> but here's the point. When people act irresponsibly, Someone else has to shoulder the load. Someone else has to come up behind and clean up the mess and pay the bill for it. That's just the way it is in life. And so if we do not train up our children to live responsibly, what we're really doing is we're setting them out into this world and we're setting them up for failure. We're setting them up for hurt and pain. And, and, and just for a second, hold on a second. Students, I realize that your parents have done the best that they think they can. And sometimes it's been great. Sometimes you, you might think that you could have done a better job parenting yourself, but you'll find out later you probably couldn't. <laughs> but even when you leave, after the last 17 or 18 years under their influence, you now have to take responsibility for yourself. They've been trying to teach that to you. But now the rubber hits the road. And you have that decision to make. Is my plight in life always going to be someone else's fault? Or am I going to take responsibility? Am I going to be the victim or am I going to be victorious? It will be determined by your willingness to take responsibility for yourself. Got it? Yes. This means yes. yes sir. This means no. This means I don't know. All right. Got it? All right. I'll be back with you in a few minutes. I want you to listen to a, a statement about irresponsibility. Irresponsibility occurs whenever one person chooses to not take responsibility for the things for which they should be responsible. Irresponsibility occurs when we believe we're entitled to something which we've taken no responsibility for. And so it doesn't matter if, whether... Um, whether someone else is responsible or not, we have to learn, we have to become responsible for our own actions, our own attitudes, our own ambitions. And if we don't, we will become not just part of the problem, we'll become a victim of our own undoing. And there are many of us that could probably stand here and give testimony to that. Here's what responsibility is. Responsibility involves personal accountability, and the ability to act without guidance or superior authority. One person said it this way, a person is regarded as responsible when they're capable of making moral and rational decisions on their own and, listen to this, and willing to be answerable for their behavior. So it's not just, hey, I made this decision. And guys, listen, there's going to be decisions you're going to make and you're going to blow it. You're going to make the wrong decision. But you can, in that moment, you can go, you know what? I'm going to pass the blame to someone else or I'm going to stand up and say, yes, 
I made the wrong decision. I'm going to own it. I'm going to own it. And whatever the consequences are for owning it, I'll own them. That's, that's, that's a key to living responsibly, is owning the results of your behavior. In the first service, I gave uh, 15 rules for living responsibly. I, I'm sure you're going to catch on pretty quick, so you can join in. This is, this is one last chance for you guys to, to armchair parent, okay, before we send these kids off. So it goes like this. Here's 15 rules for living responsibly. Number one, if you open it, close it. Hey, you guys can do better than that. Come on. If you turn it on, there you go. You guys catch this. If you unlock it, lock it up. If you break it, admit it, and offer to fix and replace it. If you borrow it, return it. If you value it, Take care of it. If you make a mess, clean it, up. clean it up. See, they can be taught. All right? If you move it, put it back. If someone else owns it and you want to use it, ask permission. If you don't know how to operate it, leave it alone. If it's none of your business, don't ask questions. If you don't want it said of you, don't say it, to don't say it to others. If you think it will brighten someone's day, say or do it. And then the last one, if it will tarnish someone's reputation, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. I think those are, are, are just some real simple ways that you can live responsibly. Now, what you may or may not know is that the Bible actually uh, speaks to the concept of responsibility all the way back in the book of Genesis. In fact, before sin entered into the world, God had given a responsibility to Adam and Eve. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, 27, 28, here's what it says. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. God said, I, I've created you, and you have these responsibilities. We know one responsibility was you can eat of any tree in this garden, but don't eat of that one. But then he also said, I created you to procreate, to populate the earth. I created you to have dominion and rule. So go rule and have dominion over the creation. Be a steward of the creation. Before sin entered into the world, God gave Adam and Eve responsibility. Responsibility is a vital part of life. Now, what happened? Well, we all know what happened. God created them with responsibility, but then Adam and Eve, according to the Genesis account, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they blew it. Now, before I go there, let me just make a comment. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but I don't know that I believe Adam and Eve were literal people. I get that. Some of you think it's, a, it's allegory. Some of you think that, that it's a legend. But even if it were those, there's still a great principle that God's trying to teach us here. Now, I personally, I personally believe Adam and Eve were real. And the reason I believe that is because every time Jesus talked about him, he talked about him as literal people. And so if it's just okay with you and me, I'm going to go with Jesus on this one. I believe they were real people. I believe this was a real event, a historical event. Okay? So what we do know is that they, they, the, the certain serpent came into the garden. He tempted Eve, even though God had said, don't eat of this tree. And he gets Eve to take, and she then gives it to Adam, and, and they fall. Their eyes are open, and they saw themselves as naked. Here's what the account says in Genesis 3, verse 10. Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden and hid from the Lord among the trees. And the Lord called to Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And God asked, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Well, verse 12 may be one of the most important verses in all the Bible. I want you to listen. Adam said, yes, I did, God. And I take full responsibility for my actions. <laughs> Do with me as you will, but leave Eve out of this. She is innocent. 
For those of you who are not laughing, you probably need to start reading your Bible. <laughs> because that's not what it says. Here's what it says. Adam replied, God, it was the woman that you gave me. Immediately, he, he, he blames someone else. That is the nature of the fall. That's the nature of sin. That's the nature of when we make mistakes. Instead of owning it, we want to divert. We want to push the blame to someone else, even if that blame goes to God. I heard a funny story this week about a, a, a minister who was driving down the road, and he was driving a, a little bit... Uh, well, let's just say that he was driving bad enough that the police pulled him over. And when he pulled him over, he, he looks in the car and he sees a bottle on the floorboard, a wine bottle on the floorboard. And the policeman looks at the pastor and says, have you been drinking? He goes, no, I've not been drinking. That's a bottle of water. He goes, that's not a bottle of water. That's a bottle of wine. The pastor goes, it's a miracle. He did it again. And the point is, is that even in those situations, we want to blame someone else. And if we can blame God, we'll blame God. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people blame God. I've had people come to my office and blame God for the condition of their marriage. I've had people come and blame God for the, for the, for the, for the way their children are living or the things that their children have done. The problem is, is that we were not created to play the blame game. We were created to live responsibly. Life to be successful, life to work, requires that we own up and take responsibility for our actions. And, and it wasn't just Adam. Look what happens with Eve. Uh, he, he goes and says, it's the woman you gave me. And then he says, then God asked woman, what have you done? And did she go, well, God, I'll take responsibility? No, she said, it was the serpent. The devil made me do it. Both of them, because that is what happens as a result of sin. That's what happens as a result of the fall. We do not want to be held accountable for our actions. We want someone else to pay the price, someone else to clean up the mess, someone else to flip the bill. And so that, this is why this is such a critical lesson, parents. And students, this is why this is such a critical lesson for you. Here in three months, two months, you're going to be leaving the fold. You're going to be going off. And you're going to be around people who are going to live grossly irresponsible. Some of them are going to be your friends. Some of them are going to be your classmates. And you're going to see people make decisions, some of which could cost them their lives. Some of which, which they may say, you know what, it won't make a bit of difference. We're just here to have a good time. And yet they can change the course of their life by living irresponsibly in a moment. You must understand, you have to get this. Only you can be responsible for you. Only you can live responsibly. And so parents, we've got to do everything we can in the moments that we have to get our kids to that point. And so I'm gonna make this real simple. How do we do it? For those of you who, who were here last week with your little boys and girls and you're thinking, okay, how are we gonna do it? I think there's two things that we have to do as parents if we're, going, if we're going to train our children to live responsibly. Number one, and this is, this is huge, we have to model responsibility by living responsibly. We have to model responsibility. See, irresponsibility is contagious. It's infectious. We see it spreading rampant through our culture. And so if we do not want our children to live irresponsibly, they're going to learn it. They're going to see it modeled. They're going to see us live up to and own up to the decisions we make. And so it's critical that we own our responsibility to raise our children in the admonition of the Lord. You know what that means? That means that it's important. If you want your children to know Christ, if you want your children to know the Word of God, if you want your children to, to, to live for God, then you need to do it. They need to see you with the Bible open sometime other than on Sundays. They need to see that Christ is critical in your life. 
They need to see those moments when you're struggling with God's will and your will and how you come to, to be obedient and responsive to God's heart for you. And it's not just something they need to see, it's something that you need to teach them. It needs to be, it needs to be caught and taught. That's what it means to live responsibly, to raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. But then second, and this is, this is just as significant, never take so much responsibility for your children's irresponsibility that you bail them out of their responsibility or the consequences of their irresponsibility. I wish I could, I wish I had the time to tell you the number of people I've had come to my office and say, how do I handle my child who's done this? And, and they've not done it once. It wasn't a mistake. It's become part of their character. And they don't know how to change it. And yet what I see happen is, is their, their child continues to make one mistake after another mistake after another mistake. And what they do is they bail their children out. They pay for their children to continue in this type of behavior. And I know why they do it. They do it because they think if I give them one more chance, maybe things will turn around. But that's also the definition of insanity. And, and so we have to, we cannot, there, there's a fine line, and I'll be honest with you, that line moves for every child, it moves in every family, and you've got to find that line of where do, I, where do I give tough love and where do I allow them to face the consequences of their behavior versus where do I give them grace and when do I help them through it? And I'll be honest with you, I think that my heart is usually to make the default to giving, giving them too much grace versus too much law. I don't know which is better, giving too much grace or too much law. I, I, I think the best way to do it is to give them Jesus. But there's a fine line between helping my kids to their demise and drawing a line in the sand that says enough is enough. All that's part of teaching responsibility. Well, as I began to think about this, I, I thought about the life and ministry of Christ. And I thought about how God exemplified, even though the disciples weren't his kids, when Jesus entered time and space and he walked with the disciples three and a half years, he modeled perfectly this idea of teaching responsibility. And one of the best examples that I saw is in John 13, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I, I want you just to listen. You can follow along with the text, but I want you really to listen to this. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew his, his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his earthly ministry, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Now, I want you to notice what's going to happen. And, and, and before I read this, you need to understand the lowliest job in all of, of, of Israel and all the, of, of ancient times was that of a foot washer. They were not even considered to be people. They were a commodity. And then it says, so Jesus got it from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet. This is one of those times in life that I would love to have been a fly on the wall. Can you imagine the, the, the looks? Can you imagine what was going on in their minds? Their master was taking the role of a, of a peasant, of a nobody. He says, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. 
And then Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. And so Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus said, a person who has bathed all over doesn't need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. That's a theological discussion for another time. And you are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. You know, Jesus never taught for head knowledge. He taught for life change. He taught for application. His instructions were always intended to move his students to action. His lessons were more than suggestions. They were critical truths essential to experiencing life. That's one reason it's so important that we spend time in the Word of God. In particular, I think it's critical that we spend time in the Gospels. We spent almost all of last year in the Gospels learning the lessons that Christ was trying to teach us. And yet, the vast majority of, of Jesus' teachings, they're absolutely juxtaposed to what may make sense to us. Think about it. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. If you want to be first, you have to be last. And, and then in this particular, particular text, he says, if you want to be great, you have to be a servant to others. Now listen to this. Fundamental and at the core of his teachings is a call to selflessness and sacrifice. His words, we know they were coated with mercy, they were coated with kindness, they were coated with a concern for others, they were immersed in humility, seasoned with grace, and expressed in love. But most importantly, his truths, they were not the rantings of a religious fanatic. They were the sound teachings. They were the sole concerns of a suffering servant. And so he did more than espouse a few lessons. He lived them. He embodied them. But don't forget this. He invested them into you and to me. What we see in this story is the call to live responsibly for yourself, for your family, for your fellow men. We're going to close our service um, a little different today. I have a gift that I want to give each of our graduates. And as you can see, it's a shoe brush. I want them to keep this in a place where it'll be on a shelf, it'll be next to their computer. It'll be where they can be reminded of the example that Christ has given to us and the call that God has on their life to live responsibly for him. But I also know that the reason they're here today, because I know that in my life there were some days that I did not know that my daughter would make it to graduation because I thought I might kill her. Um, there, are, there are some very important people, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, people who have raised these young men and women. They've served them. And I shared with the students in the first hour that they have, they have people who love them more than anything in this world, who've given everything they know to give them to help them to be prepared to leave home and to go and live responsibly. I'm gonna ask Pastor Jamie if he'll come up because just for a few minutes, instead of being the pastor, I wanna be a dad. 
but I'm also gonna ask our students that they'll come up and you guys know where you're supposed to stand. And I'm gonna ask every mom and dad here, if you raised this young man, this young woman, you may be the grandma or grandpa who raised this young man or young woman. You may be a, a, a stepmom, a stepdad, but if you were responsible for this child being in your home and helping to raise them, I'm gonna ask you to come up and Pastor Jamie is gonna give us directions on what to do. Come on, students, take your place. I'll take this. All right, if the parents, grandparents, if you're going to make your way forward here, and as you come forward, if you could stop and grab a brush, just one per child, student, sorry. And just go and uh, kind of sit in front of your student. I know it's going to be a little crowded up here, but that's all right. Two brushes. All right. All right. Parents, as you uh, look at your graduate, and uh, with your brush in hand, if for one moment, one last time maybe, would you humbly just wipe the shoes of your students' feet? just as I have done for you, please go and do for others. extend your hands toward these students because this is kind of a commissioning for them as well. They will be around this summer, but uh, they will be off in many directions, accomplishing many great things. And so would we do this? Let's, let's pray for these students now. Father, we're grateful. Lord, for what you've done in and through these students, I thank you for these parents and grandparents and adults who have helped raise these students to be the men and women of God that you've called them to be. I thank you for their hard work. God, I thank you that in the busyness of life and the craziness of life that's to come and the stress of college and other careers ahead of them, God, I pray that these students will recognize you are there. You are their Lord, you are their master, you are their king. We as a church now pray for the students. We celebrate with them this very exciting time in their life. Another milestone has come, gone, and many more to come. May you be with 
with them. May you guide them. May you protect them. May you honor them. May you bless them. And God, just as people have poured into these students, I pray these students will then turn to others and bless others with your love, with your mercy, with your grace. Father, we love you. We thank you for what 